Adam Wobbett. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Miriam. I'm delighted to be here. Yes, I'm looking forward. I was devouring your book, Do Pause, during my summer holidays. And after I finished the book, I was impatiently waiting to the end of my summer holidays so that I could open LinkedIn and invite you to join me on the podcast. Well, that's uh, a fittingly ironic. Uh, I've had the opposite, <laughs> people saying that they took forever to read Do Pause, which um, I think is also uh, enjoyable. So um, yeah, each to his own, but uh, I'm, I'm glad you found it and I'm glad to be here. Yes, and um, you also published another book is Do Improvise. So today we're going to speak about facilitation and hopefully cover the pause part and the improvisation part and anything that is in between. And let's start at the beginning. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? Uh, I think I do. Yeah, I think I talk about myself as a convener of spaces and a facilitator. And I suppose the fashionable thing to call it these days is experience design. Um, and that's a label I'm not particularly comfortable with. Uh, and I don't know if I cast my mind back, I think I probably started calling myself a facilitator or perhaps thinking of myself at least as a facilitator, probably 30 years ago. Um, I'd worked in advertising as my first career and Uh, in that context, I'd moderated focus groups, and that's the word we would mm. use. We were moderators. And so in that context, you are negotiating, if you like, between a client with an agenda and a certain number of questions that need to be asked and uh, and consumers or the general public um, uh, in, a, in the form of a small group. But that I saw as a specific skills for a specific end. And I think it was a few years after that when I started working in a more sort of consultancy capacity where I realized that much of what I was doing wasn't so much providing what these days we would call content or answers or strategies, but was actually facilitating the different people involved in the process. Mm. And there was one particular occasion where I was working for a drinks company in, uh, in some quite stressful circumstances. And um, there were essentially two groups of people involved in this uh, three day meeting and Half of them were from the head office of this company and half of them were, were from the regions or the markets. And as it happened, they sat on opposite sides of the table. And uh, it was as if it was like something out of Alice in Wonderland. It felt like the, as the day went on the first day, the table just got wider and wider and wider. As these people got <laughs> further and further and further. <laughs> and this caused me a sleepless night on that occasion. And, and, Uh, I won't go through the whole story, but essentially three days later where I had had a number of realizations about what was possible for me in my position as a facilitator that the participants couldn't themselves see and helping to um, help, helping the whole group to find a way to reconnect and understand each other. And I'll never forget being in the bar uh, afterwards in this hotel we were working in and the most senior client who was British and had this sort of very typically British way of saying things. And he turned to me and said, yes, he said, uh, yes, one day you might not be entirely bad at this. Um, <laughs> and, and that was, uh, you know, uh, to me, that was a seminal experience. And that's where I realized not only was I doing this job, that I had some um, facility with facilitation, if you like, that there was something I was doing perhaps quite instinctively or naturally that seemed at that level to be working. Mm. Yeah, that was uh, 1994, I think that was, that was. Wow, wow. And I'm, I cannot not ask the question, what is it about experience design that you cannot connect to? Um, well, I think the first few times I heard it, I didn't know what it meant. Mm -hmm. uh, so I heard people bandy it around as if it was uh, self-evident what it meant. And um Uh, and so I think uh, that kind of steers part of my reaction because I, I feel it's a phrase that if you understand what it means, then it's meaningful. But to somebody who's not heard it before, it's not particularly explanatory. So I don't think it's particularly useful. Mm -hmm. And I think in a way it is, um, uh, it can be a little bit of dressing something up as quite grand, which is actually quite uh, simple, not necessarily easy. Easy and simple are two different things, but quite mm -hmm. simple. 
um, and quite and quite ordinary and quite everyday. Um, at the same time, you know, I do have I'm I'm not that upset with it as a as a term because actually when I think carefully about what I do, I do spend an enormous amount of time and energy uh, thinking carefully about how to design not a product or an object, but yes, an experience, uh, an event, somebody, something that people come to. So it is, it is accurate. I just think it's not really, not very, really, uh, hasn't quite got the right tone for me. Yeah. And I wonder whether it goes in the direction of almost entertainment. And when I think of your example with this leadership team, <clears throat> would it, could you really summarize the work you were doing as experience design? Because yes, maybe it's also about the experience, but it's much more than that. It's really yeah. getting getting them closer together, <laughs> shrinking yeah, the table. Absolutely. In that case, it was a very, a very thorny, very deep, quite actually, it was the legacy of a structural issue within a company, as I'm sure uh, you know, many people can imagine with what I've said. And uh there was nothing about it that was necessarily to do with entertainment. It was to do with problem solving. It was to do with creating connection. It was about um, resolving misunderstandings and conflicts. Um, there was, I mean, I suppose the entertainment piece would come in in that some of the ways we did that on that particular occasion involved drawing and some of them involved exercises involving movement and being outside in the gardens. But those things weren't for the purpose of entertainment. They were necessary steps in order to get to the real core issue that was that was going on, mm. which is about misunderstanding and conflict. And when I hear movement and drawing and getting out in the garden, I um, obviously maybe think of the improvisation work that you're doing, which is embod embodied. So how did you bring this together from the beginning? Or how did you connect these to the facilitation yeah. and the improvisation at some point? Yeah, so um, I think what's, there's a bit of context necessary here. So what has always interested me is the kind of messy everyday world we live in, not the sort of sanitized, clean version that's on the organigram in the organization, if it's a business context or in the laboratory, if it's if it's a, a kind of scientific approach to something. So the sort of messy everyday world is what had always interested me. And uh, so when I came across improvisation, uh, which happened by chance, uh, I met somebody who was a professional improviser on the stage. I realized that they have a way of 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 dealing with the kind of unpredictable mess of everyday life uh, that that we have to deal with in in organizations and in business and also that science deals with in a body of science i've got very interested in called complexity science uh, which i've been drawn to for the same reason because it deals with the kind of everyday nature of messy reality not that clean laboratory version uh, but the trouble was that i'd sort of tried the science as a tool for facilitation actually and that had gone horribly wrong when <laughs> There was one workshop I was running where somebody said, why does this sound like a new religion? Uh, which wasn't uh, what I'd been hoping for, I have to say. Um, uh, and we can explore that question if it's of interest. But mm -hmm. um, but so I'd, I'd sort of struggled with this. And then when I came across this professional improviser and we just fell into a kind of very ordinary kind of getting to know each other kind of conversation. And I could see from the things he was saying immediately that this was a very simple, playful, ordinary way that there was a kind of method uh, uh, underlying what people in the theatre do that you could take and use elsewhere. And um, and in that very first meeting with this guy, who's now one of my best friends, a guy called Gary Hirsch, uh, I asked him a question. I said, could you use that to facilitate a, a, a group of top executives from an advertising agency? And he went, oh, yeah, sure, as if he did it every day. Because I later on learned he was going, kind of, ah, like that inside. But, <laughs> The, the discipline of improv itself would say to you, you say yes to things, you know. Mm -hmm. And so and so we very quickly began working together and um, uh, it, it turned out to have all the features and benefits I've been looking for as uh, tools to use with groups of people that I'd been sort of hoping that the scientific approach would bring, but which I wasn't able to kind of make work. So, yeah, it was a a very sweet coming together of a number of strands through this piece of happenstance, really. Mm. 
Beautiful. And I would love to come back to the new religion piece. Mm. And um, yeah, let's dive. Let's dive right away into it. If you don't mind. Yeah. yeah. Of course not. Yeah. So I think that, um, so uh, that my path into this was, it's quite funny. I realized this just the other day that I, I first was struck by a, a presentation uh, about catastrophe theory. That was the the first thing uh, that, and this was a, um, in the ad agency in which I worked. Somebody came in talking about catastrophic events like a- avalanches and things and how you, whether you can predict them or not and how you can predict them. And then I thought that was all fascinating because the, again, an avalanche, like a real thing. Um, and then after that, I got, uh, interested in chaos theory mm-hmm. and then after that that led to complexity theory and all of these sort of scientific bodies of work are ways like i say of of understanding um the kind of the complex nature of everyday reality and uh and so i got kind of very curious about this for various reasons to do with my own education and some of its shortcomings and i spent a month uh, at a place in England called Schumacher College with a scientist called Fritjof Capra, who originally worked in quantum mechanics, but had subsequently kind of done a lot of work about complex adaptive systems in a biological context. And so I'd sort of been steeped in this um, very different way of seeing the world. And I was starting to kind of, if you think of it as like learning a language, I was starting to be able to speak this language and understand it. And like all of these sub-worlds, there are reference points and names. So Ilya Prigogine, King of Fritjof Capra, quantum mechanics, emergent points, dissipated structures, attractor basins. There's a lot of language that comes with mm-hmm. it. And all of these things mean particular things in this mind. But of course, I'd forgotten at the point I was trying to use it in a workshop that I'd traveled very far and the people I was with hadn't started that journey at all. And so when you start referring to or quoting or using the language both of people or of concepts that you're you're speaking them as if they were Mm self-evident and yet they're completely opaque to the people involved then it sounds both mysterious i.e incomprehensible but also slightly mystical it's like oh there's some woo-woo going on here very exclusive Mm -hmm. exclusive. i never heard of any of these people or any of these things so um i think that's what was behind it this idea that oh there's a closed world over here with its own private language Mm -hmm. that that i can't speak and so if you're leading something where you're helping to or hoping to invite people to discover and learn and create then that's not very helpful so it it was a very um, uncomfortable comment in the moment and a very helpful comment over time because it helped me to see what some of the limitations of that way of working were versus the improvisational way of approaching many very similar ideas is playful participative uh it's very light uh it runs another risk which is of, of being seen as sort of trivial and inconsequential um but there are things you can do to to kind of offset that as well. There are several thoughts that come to my mind. <laughs> One is it almost seems as if in the scientific approach you described previously, it's first you have to set the ground and explain all the things to then make sense out of it. Whereas in the improv, with the improv approach, you first experience it, you play it, you do it, and then you have to do the hard work to make sense and to debrief. So that yeah, it that's, that's beautifully put. Uh, and I think to build on that, there's a disadvantage to the scientific approach because the scientific one necessarily requires a lot of the explanation to happen with a particular kind of intelligence. So it's conceptual, it's abstract. It often requires a prior understanding of lots of other ideas and bodies of knowledge it doesn't engage our multiple intelligences. And at that point, it's quite hard to see how it's connected to what I'm doing or interested in as a participant. Whereas with the improvisational way of working, there are, as I say, other traps. You have to be careful not to be seen as trivial. There's something Gary and I identified very early, which is something we call a fun barrier, Mm. um, which we can explore a bit more if you like. But... um, but essentially, you're inviting people to participate more fully, as you rightly said earlier, um, the improvisational way of working, at least as it comes out of the theatre, is embodied. Uh, 
So you're using movement, you're using position, posture, um, you're using a much wider range of things. And and even if they're slightly skeptical, um, at heart, everybody, the vast majority of people enjoy playing. Yeah. And so as long as you can find a way to make sense of that playing for them, which is, as you absolutely rightly pointed out, you can do uh, afterwards and you can do it quite quickly. Um, and you can do as much of an explanation as you need to get them to want to participate very quickly at the beginning. You know, you can do that in a few seconds almost. Yeah. Um, so so that way you've you've had them you, in a way you sort of caught them succeeding because the, the other big truth here is we do all improvise. None of us have a script. None of us live lives where everything is determined or predictable or controlled. And so the improvisational approach in a way is to catch people succeeding, mm. uh, catch them doing something they can already do. And then to mm -hmm. shine a bit more light on that by, by giving some names to it, by making some observations about it, and then by helping them to connect it to the things they care about. Yeah. So, you know. What I um, also find interesting is I think, an underestimated part of the work of a facilitator is to help the group to get out of their heads. And this is especially important for groups that are very cognitive. So highly educated people who might in the first, on the first sight, maybe be attracted to this more scientific approach, then they might get stuck because they're too much in their head. And this blocks in terms of creativity, because then you have all this judgment coming in and all this um, expectations. Whereas when you get them into their body quickly, then it's easier to reconnect it to the mind. I think that's absolutely right. I don't think this was something I understood at the beginning. I probably had a hunch or a feeling about it, but over time reflecting upon it, I think that's absolutely right. And I think... I think that the, our cognitive and intellectual skills are massively important, but I think we point them the wrong way. Mm -hmm. In other words, I think that the intellect and the cognition are really, really important for making sense through reflection of what's already happened. I don't think they're very good or very useful at trying to create new possibility or even understanding what's going on in the present moment while we're doing it. And so I think the other intelligences, and we have language for this now, thanks to you know Howard Gardner and Daniel Goleman and people like that. So this idea of multiple intelligences, that our intelligence isn't just our cognition or our intellect. And I think that puts it on a kind of a, a firmer footing. So by invoking and inviting those other intelligences into the, into the room, mm -hmm. um, and those intelligences are enormous and subtle and massive and fast, Uh, then we can use our intellect to its best capacity to make sense of that experience. And so the way of working that we just sketched out between us with improvisation of a very quick or brief framing, some, some playful experience where people move and use their bodies, and then a debrief where you make sense of it for them is kind of, for me, in micro, what I think we would be better suited at doing in macro. And I think this, this can get us into very deep waters very quickly, so tell me if it's not of interest. But it seems to me that if you go... If you go back to the Enlightenment, um, the the project of the Enlightenment has created the modern world and all the glories and wonders that come with it, from modern medicine to technology, science, and, and everything that goes along with it. In, in fact, it's been so successful that we sometimes realize it's not the way things are. It's a particular way mm -hmm. of looking and thinking, mm -hmm. which has an enormous number of virtues. But in that act of forgetting we we miss that it has a shadow side mm -hmm. and so what we've become in my view is we've become too dependent upon one particular way of thinking so that people who are in positions of authority and power will sometimes be um think it's strange to uh move or dance or sing or draw um which in actual fact nothing could be further from the truth so there's a kind of exaggerated sense of how important cognition and intellect and intellect is and in, it's interesting, I was just reading some philosophy last week, a wonderful book by a guy called Brian, Brian McGee, who's a philosopher I'm very fond of, and him talking talking about how, how important it is that in all human society we use the arts and why we would have had to invent arts and culture anyway had we not had them already, because they allow us different ways of knowing things and different ways of understanding things. So in the facilitator's world, the use of what might 
crudely be thought of as different media and they are they are different media using you know colors and shapes and music and movement and all those things but they're not trivial these are quite important ways of of seeing feeling knowing and understanding things in a different way and then yes we'll need to sit down and order it and structure it with our intellects but trying to go forward um using only intellect and cognition some people can do it and in some contexts it's appropriate but even in science even in physics you know we get einstein's theory as relativity because he's sitting in a post office in zurich imagining riding on a beam of light he, it's not he's not working it out it's an active imagination that he then works out into formulae and equations so so i completely agree with you i think that whether we acknowledge it or not we are all embodied beings and much of what's going on between us and inside of us is not available to the intellect or not immediately available to the intellect yes which somehow comes or relates then to the pause because what comes to my mind is this shower moment that mm. our best ideas come while we're under the shower or while we are running or doing something totally irrelated where we pause because we are not actively thinking about something. And I think these um, interactions with different media is a sort of pause, a creative pause from an interruption from what we usually do. Absolutely. Um, so pause is not nothing. A pause is not empty. A pause is, a, as you say, an interruption from what we normally do. It's an interruption of something and an invitation to something else. Mm. And uh, the shower example, which is, uh, we have a lovely saying in Spanish, which is to, to, to instead of saying to sleep on it, like we do in English, we say to consult with the pillow. You know? <laughs> so uh, there's the shower and there's sleeping on ideas. And, and there are different um, levels and kinds of mind uh, um, which are working instinct intuition uh, feeling these are all working um, uh, well whether they're working or not is not dependent upon you being consciously thinking about it so when you switch off in one way you kind of open up space for for another way of thinking to happen um, and this is uh, this is kind of very important because many of the issues or problems we're trying to deal with are uh, in organizations anyway and in business um if there was a simple straightforward linear solution that you could reason your way to well we'd probably have it already and there are problems like that and you've probably got the solutions to those and you've got the plans being put in place so the, the ones we're left with are the ones which are more intractable more difficult more amorphous you might not even know which the real issue is and just bringing this back to design the design for a facilitator um it, it lands in a very robust place which is so don't think that when you design in breaks nothing's happening mm -hmm. you know one of my colleagues at oxford thinks and talks very eloquently about you should design the spaces as well as the sessions and so you know there's a leadership program i've been part of at oxford which is a sort of week-long piece of facilitation uh, where there's a team of six or seven of us that that hold it all together and You know, the bus rides to certain venues, the dinners, the coffee breaks, the yoga class in the morning, the Tai Chi on the lawn, the casual conversation by the coffee break, you know, by coffee station. These we've all considered. We haven't sort of planned them microscopically, but we are aware of them and available to them and have thought about the qualities of those spaces, you know. Yeah. Um And I think especially when we meet in the physical space to design for these serendipitous moments of the coffee machine where the magic actually happens because two yeah. or more minds have the opportunity to exchange their perspectives on something they have experienced together. Absolutely. And the way, one of the ways I think about that, and so in, in Oxford we have probably say 36 or 37 participants for a week and there's six or seven of us that uh, that follow the week through there are other people come in and do presentations and deliver content but we're there the whole time and, and one of the things I, I i kind of think about is what i call maximizing the surface area of the faculty mm -hmm. and so part of the design for that serendipity 
is that I think the first one I've already mentioned is is to first acknowledge that it's a possible space for something to happen. So to not think of it as a time, you know, as downtime. Then the second thing is on the part of all the faculty, what I mean by maximizing the surface area is for me as a tutor on that program to seek out perhaps somebody who perhaps I haven't spoken to or perhaps I'm paying close attention and going, oh, they look a bit lost. I wonder what's going on there. Or to be a connective tissue and say you're talking with somebody over coffee and they mention something that you've heard somebody else talk about or that you think somebody else has a has a, an, a, a perspective to offer. And so very actively then to say, you should talk to John about that. Mm-hmm. Or Mary, why don't you tell Fred about what you were telling me there? And so all of these things, which, as I say, aren't, I'm not talking about micro planning here. These, but you're, I'm talking about raising your awareness and 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 holding the space in a way that increases the amount of contact, increases the number of p- possible pieces of serendipity. You can never guarantee them. You never know what they're going to be. Um, but if you put the same thing the other way around, you know that if you don't do that and you line people up in a queue and you give them numbers, you know that's not going to happen, right? So. Um, so yeah, you can you can you can pay attention to those things. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I believe that the participants, for them, it will pass almost unnoticed that it, it has been designed, and still they will realize that something is happening. Absolutely. And uh it's one of the things on that particular program we've had to learn to do which is to sort of as it were draw the curtain aside occasionally because they have a sort of sublime experience of it often where they just go oh this is like magic and you know it's amazing and they and they think it just happens and, why do we need so many people to organize that well that we get from the <laughs> bean counters but exactly but the participants themselves think of it as something magical now whilst that's very flattering and there are elements of kind of magic to it magical moments of course but um it's also an inhibiting thing because if they you know we are there this is a leadership program and we the faculty are leading the program so we are actually doing the work as we understand it and so if they just think we're specially talented or uniquely brilliant at it that's not helpful because how do they learn from that so we've had to learn to as i say draw the curtain aside a bit or sometimes to unpack or unpick or point out did you see what we did there? Mm. Normally towards the back end of the week. Yeah. I mean, the most extreme case I had of that came much more recently. Actually, it was the end of last year. I was doing a course on facilitation, um, a week-long course at Schumacher College, where I met Fritjof Capra, uh, funnily enough, all those years ago. Um, and my colleague, I was working with another colleague, and uh, she had a migraine the, the last morning, and she had been due to run the last morning. And I got this news after the session had be, had been meant to begin. So 27 people, they've had a wonderful week, but they're expecting it to come together in some way. And uh, my colleague can't make it. And I now have no time. And so it was a very interesting moment. And... Um, so I stood up and, and and explained what had happened. Jenny, Jenny can't make it, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I had a decision, which was I could I could just carry on. I can think of something to do. I can think while I'm presenting. We've got we've done enough. There's enough trust in the room. You know, I can do it and not show the workings. But this is a facilitation course. And so I chose to say to go a step further and to say, here's what's just what has happened. So now what's ha- here's what's happening for me. So I'm standing up in front of all of you and I don't know what we're going to do. So here's what I'm thinking. And here's where we might start. And I'm thinking out loud as I'm, I'm basically designing on my feet something for this group of people. Uh, and over the course of a few minutes, they help me simplify it. We end up with something. I send them off to do the tasks. They come back. And then there's obviously a, a debrief, not just of that exercise, but of the whole week at the end. And what was very interesting was that uh, one person said he he was absolutely terrified and kind of angry when I did that, because he felt that there was that it was somehow irresponsible that we weren't prepared. But of course, we couldn't prepare for my colleague having a migraine. That's just you know that's just stuff that happens. Um, and and 
but he went on to say, so I, you know, I was a bit angry and I was frustrated on it. But then he said, but the amazing thing was, it was incredible. It did work. <laughs> and so I sort of felt, um, yeah, vindicated by that. And I thought it was a, just an extreme case of of showing what's actually going on and, and of trusting, you know, the group and trusting one's knowledge and experience and of not being frightened of saying what's actually in the room. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this example. And it's, I think that's the beauty of facilitation and then also bringing in the, um, the improvisation. This split of a second where you are taking a decision to either go left or to go right and then to own it. Right. Um, to make your partner look good, <laughs> make the participants look good. Yeah. Um, and then share it. Um, and I think that's one of the, might have been one of the most important lessons on how to learn how to facilitate. Yeah, I think there I think there is a big, a big thing here, a big piece here, which is that nothing's ever as frightening as it feels. You know, and so the the feeling that one has of fear and trepidation, and you know, I was I was despite you know 30 odd years of experience and being steeped in improvisation, that was a difficult moment, you know, because you have to make a choice. But if you start from a place of kind of generosity, generosity, if you start from the place about, well, will they have an interest in helping helping me solve this? And anyway, it's all of our issues. It's not my issue. That would be mm. egotistical of me to think it was all about me. And, and then so that's what, not facilitation. That's not what the facilitation mindset is, that it would be about you. Exactly, exactly. But what's interesting is we're, we're such fearful, anxious creatures that those those fears and anxieties can very quickly creep up on us. And so situations, you know, like, well, what would you do if the exercise went wrong? Um, you know, that's an understandable fear that we each of us have had and, and some people have a lot. But you kind of go, well, actually, how bad could it be? You know, what will happen if it goes wrong? First of all, what let's define wrong. It might what happens might be different than what you expect, but what happens might be more interesting than you might expect or more revealing. Um, and uh and actually if you what you what you get to find out is what happens after it quote unquote goes wrong. Mm. But but nobody dies, you know, it's not, it's like our our bodily systems are often acting as if we're under real life threat when actually it's just a, an ego thing, you know. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of training or teaching facilitation that every, every of those moments is a fantastic opportunity to reflect on a meta level on facilitations. So why did it go wrong? Was it too complex? Was it because of the instructions Were the group too large, too small? All of these are pieces that future facilitators can learn a lot from by experiencing it. Absolutely. And I, these days, I don't really think about things going wrong at all. You know, so there's a, another colleague who works with improvisation where he says, we have different perspectives on this. He talks about um, don't be frightened of failure. And I say, what's failure? You know, because what you define as a failure, I would say anything and everything is something you can take and use. So many of the most fruitful learning experiences for me and for the group I was facilitating have occurred when you could say something failed. And I say you could say something failed because let's say the group didn't understand the instructions, you know, but that created a whole series of responses that were much more interesting and rich than had everything gone swimmingly. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think that's right. And I think one of the things that keeps me interested in facilitating is that it is a wonderful education for oneself because you're constantly having to check in and see, oh, is that, is it, oh, have I fallen into thinking it's about me or am I concerned? I mean, that that story I told about the very first time I realized this was what I was doing, the sleepless night I had, uh, it was the summer, so there wasn't much dark. And I was out at four o'clock in the morning walking around the gardens of this big posh hotel. And I realized that what was getting in the way of the group was me worrying about how I 
was looking. And I, I could, um, I, there was in my kind of anxiety and fatigue, there was a thing I just noticed. I was thinking about, well, what will they think of me? But this is my agenda. But I thought, and it was I, me, I, me, I, me. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not, that comes later. And of course, just as you said, the way in an improv discipline, I hadn't done any improv at this point, but the thing is, if you look after your colleagues, they'll look after you, right? So mm. if, and that's exactly what happened for me on that day, which was by looking after what the group needed, I got that uh, somewhat humorous comment from the client at the end, which was from him, coming from him, very high praise indeed, you know. Um, so yeah, this, this kind of, um, the opportunity and the joy of the work is to, is to realize that uh, it's it's all stuff to learn from. Yeah. So, what would you consider as a failed workshop? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, a good counter question. Um, uh, frankly, I would consider a failed workshop uh, one where exactly what you expected to happen happens, mm. and so. For some people, it's opportunity for learning, basically. Yeah. So now sometimes that might be appropriate, but that's essentially a political process. So we're having a gathering of people. We know the result we want to get. We've got to get these people to agree with us and everything goes exactly as you want and you get them out. You kind of go, well, OK, you might need to do that occasionally. But that's not, for me, a facilitation process. That's a political process. And, uh, of, you know, of kind of convincing and and sort of having everybody having agendas and and you coming out with yours intact it sounds like a theater play as opposed to an improv play yeah where the political that. process is a theater play a scripted yeah. play and yeah. a workshop is an improv play i mean there's other ways that they can fail um that workshop could or, or could fail temporarily i suppose you know so um You know, there's one workshop I was doing where the fire alarm went off at the venue we were at and we were all outside. It was November. It was freezing cold and we had to stay outside for hours um, in the freezing cold because nobody was sure if this was a test or, a, you know, a false alarm. Um, and, and that, in a way, was kind of a, a failure because the sort of the workshop kind of stopped, you know, and it was grim and it was cold. But there was another occasion at Oxford where actually there was a, a fairly... Um, a fairly miserable terrorist attack. Somebody planted an incendiary bomb um, in the venue that we were working at. And we managed to move the whole program to a hotel nearby in the course of about uh, 12 hours. Uh, and it was done so elegantly that, that the participants all thought it was part of the plan. <laughs> Which takes us back to your point about when you do things really elegantly. And I think this is a, it's another thing for facilitators to consider is oftentimes the most extraordinary, exquisite, beautiful work that you do will not be noticed or acknowledged because people think uh, it was either it was just going to happen or they thought it was part of the plan or they thought it was about their own brilliance. Um, and that just comes with the territory, right? Partly a, a, a good test of a facilitator is is to make it look effortless, effortless. Yeah. yeah. Which then requires the inner work and uh, Absolutely. forgetting about the ego. And also a trust and faith that that the deep inner work, um, for anybody that is alive to it or awake to it, which is uh, probably more people than you might imagine, does get noticed. But it doesn't get noticed, doesn't get necessarily put down on the feedback forms. It doesn't necessarily get into the evaluations there's a deeper appreciation that happens there. Um, so in the end, it does pay off. But what you can't be doing is making your choices in order to gain approval. Mm. You have to, and I think you're absolutely right to shine a light on the inner work is I don't see how you can be uh, a, a kind of, how you can do truly valuable work as a facilitator without some inner work. Yeah. I, I, I just don't see that that's possible because it's a human thing, you know. And there are too many potential triggers involved in human dynamics that if you're not standing there, having yeah. dealt with your inner shit. Well, the other thing is, you know, um, I remember uh, this particular room that I used a lot in Oxford over many, many years. And 
you know, my natural style of working had always been kind of collaborative and kind of getting along with people, if you like. And uh, in this context, that you know, the business school at Oxford University with illustrious people in the group and in the, you know, in the in the wings and kind of, um, you know, famous speakers coming in and everything, I realized that there was that the style I naturally adopted had limitations and that the group needed me on occasion to not just be in the center of the room, but to really hold it and use the power that it gave. And that came with some authority. And I don't naturally like being kind of uh, authoritative about things. It isn't the kind of way I'd learned to work up until then. And But what was really helpful to me is to understand that this was a requirement of the whole setting. So there are times when you, if you like, you have to have done the inner work to see that the situation calls upon me to exercise a muscle or a style that is not my favorite, um, uh, but it needs done. <clears throat> and so sometimes that for me would be saying to people, no, stop that. Mm. Uh, we don't have time for that. That's a very interesting question. Come and talk to me afterwards and to close people down and shut them off um, or to, <coughs> excuse me, to, yeah, to speak with authority about a subject where, you know, I might feel uh, like uh, there were colleagues in the room who knew more, but they weren't in the center of the room at that point. And I needed to be able to speak with that voice and, you know, do that kind of stuff. So that inner work, you have, there's lots of different ways you have to transcend yourself um, when you're going to do this, do this work. And just caught my curiosity to to hear this no from someone who is an improviser yeah um feels like a challenge or sounds like a challenge yeah i mean it's this is a beautiful one when i was a novice at this i used to struggle with this but it's actually it's actually super sweet because uh, one of the myths around improvisation is that improvisation is all about saying yes mm -hmm. uh, that's not even true on the improv stage it's actually not physically possible because um, actually by saying yes to something you're saying no to something else so the two are much more interestingly related um, but the thing here is uh, and the reason I, I love this as a topic now is to say that um, is to say that yes and no each have uh, merit and worth and even within the improvisational discipline that is true it's but you need to know what the merit and worth of each is and what the shortcomings of each are so if you're at the generative point where you need a flow of ideas and you need a flow of energy, then no comes at a high cost. But if you're trying to reach a conclusion or make a connection or give something meaning where there are too many things, too many ideas swirling around, then you say yes at your peril because you just create more and more confusion and complexity. So it, as a story evolves, if you just take story as an analogy for whatever you're interested in, but improvisers make stories at the beginning of a story, you have to say yes a lot. And towards the end of a story, you have to say no a lot more because otherwise the story just gets balloons out of shape. And how do you, how do you say no in a very practical sense and still make your partner look good? Uh, well, through it's again, this takes us back to the multiple intelligences, if you like, because the word no has there's many different ways you can render the word no i can say no 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 <laughs> no so mood tone setting gesture posture position all of these things all of the physical cues um you know so uh you know if i stand behind if you and i are working together and you're you know you're suggesting something that i want to say no to i might make a joke out of it by standing behind you and, and kind of miming to the group no no <laughs> you know i might do that uh or i might say But no, no, Miriam, I think if you check the time, I think we probably we probably need to move on now. Let's let's not do that. And so it, there's a million ways of saying no. Mm -hmm. um, and and once you get used to it and stop this kind of fantasy that you can say yes to everything and yes is good and no is bad, then um, then you you'll you'll see how appreciative a group is. Mm. Um, yeah. 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 And the, it's a craft. It's a craft. You have to learn that skill. It's not. It's not simple. Not simple yeah. at all. I recently realized that also the what we associate to the words yes and no might be very different. So just saying yes must not necessarily mean I agree. 
Exactly. Yeah. With yes, I can also mean I hear you, I acknowledge what you have said, and I add something that does not agree with what you've said. That's right. And we, we have some refined language for we, we've developed out of the theatrical work for this. So we talk about the difference between accepting and acquiescing. Well, agreeing, accepting and acquiescing. Mm. So, so accepting in, in, in the improv context means to acknowledge the reality that you are presented with, to accept at that level. Mm. Whereas to acquiesce is to just give in and agree. And so the example I will often use is if I'm with a group of leaders and facil facilitating a session with them and and I'm talking about accepting or saying yes. And they say, well, I, you know, but I can't always say I can't, you know, I couldn't accept that. Say somebody comes for a pay rise, you know, and they, they say they want a pay rise. I can't say yes to that. And I say, well, you don't have to say yes to the pay rise, but you can accept that offer by them through saying, so I see that you feel you deserve a pay rise. So you're not agreeing that they should get a pay rise, but you're acknowledging and accepting the reality that that person wants a pay rise. And then you could say to them, so sorry, so yeah, help me understand why you feel that. And then the onus is back on them uh, versus saying, yeah, you want, a, you want a pay rise? Great. How much do you want? Mm. That, that's not in our language accepting. There's an important difference. So this is uh, to unpack, if you like, these different forms of yes and what you're exactly saying yes to um uh and i think the the there's great power in being able to acknowledge the reality that the other person or other party or group sees doesn't mean you have to agree with it yeah and it opens so many opportunities to deepen the conversation exactly. as opposed to a no where i realize that i come from a family of no say yes mm. in the sense that my parents would often start a sentence with no. No, I totally agree. No, we should definitely do that. <laughs> no, that's great, Miriam. No, that's such a, I have a colleague who does that. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I think it's a cultural thing, maybe. Right. And throughout my childhood, I never realized. And now I'm yeah. so sensitive to language that every right. time I listen to them, I'm like, wait, yeah, you just said no. I have to shake the nose off. Yeah. And yeah. what it does to me is, It's like, a, yeah, as if someone is slamming the door in front of me, as opposed to yes, where I lean in and get more curious, although someone might then redirect me into a different direction and not give me the pay rise. Yeah. And this is this is how we think of it in improv. So we talk about flow, right? So the flow in this case, not being uh, the six and the highly form of flow, not that flow state, but the flow between different, in our case, actors or participants or colleagues or whoever it is. So, uh, you know, accepting is, accepting generates flow uh, and blocking uh, cuts flow. Mm. Uh, but you can, when you, when you get into the detail of it, you can accept by saying no. No, I can't give you a pay rise, but I'm really interested in why you want one. And I really do think you might deserve one. So let's have a talk about that. So what that would do is it keeps conversation flowing. It goes back to them mm. and they can then add some more information. Um, Or um, uh, you can block by saying yes. Uh, that's normally through the kind of the tone, you know, yes. But anyway, <laughs> or yes, but. You know. um, uh, so there's uh, and another form of blocking, which is very common, which we is tend we tend not to see so much. It's quite it can be done quite subtly is the sort of just changing the subject, you know, so. Yes, that's lovely. Thank you for that. Um, so what I was thinking was, <laughs> and actually you've, you've blocked the mm. previous offer, I'm using offer in the improv sense here is anything and everything that happens that you can take and use because you haven't seen it or done anything with it. So that's the, the other part of accepting is to take something and, and see it, acknowledge it and do something with it. The range of what you can do with it is enormous. Um, it's not like there's just one solution. But accepting keeps this flow going. And as a facilitator, so for example, you know, when I first started working with improv, I was talking to a very wise old friend of mine who was the dean of the business school at Portland State University. And um, and basically I was going to go off and try and play games with a bunch of serious, important people, you know, and I was terrified. And uh, and I said to him, so what do I do if, what do I, I do if it doesn't work? 
uh, and he's a man of very few words, actually. And he said, rocked back in his chair, and there was this long pause. And then he said, um, what would not work? What, what would it mean for it to not work? And I said, well, you know, I mean, they could just refuse to play. Uh, and he said, would it would that be it not working? Or would it would that be it working in a way you hadn't anticipated? And so if you take that as a block, people refusing to play, this is where the this is incredibly empowering for a facilitator. Because if you let go of your judgment, oh my God, I didn't explain it right there, you know, this is a wrong exercise to choose, blah, blah. If you let go of all that, because they've now refused to play, either physically or somebody said, no, we're not going to do that. If you use that block as an offer, so you ask yourself, oh, great, how can I use the fact they've refused to play? Then you become incredibly empowered because you kind of go, oh, that's really interesting. Well, what, what, why is that? You know? yeah. And I had this once with a guy, this is hilarious. I thought this was a piece of suicide on the part of this part participant. So I was facilitating a workshop in Rome. Uh, it was a multicultural group. We did an exercise, debriefed it, lots of interesting comments. And and then it was the British guy. And I have to say, I'm British, so I can say this. Often it is the British guys in <laughs> multicultural groups who are kind of too cool for school. And and he let he let everybody else speak. And then at the end he said, he said, Well, I thought it was stupid. I thought that was an absolute waste of time. Yeah. And and there's the moment, right? So now you're what do I do here? And, um, you know, some days I would collapse inwardly and all that kind of stuff. But on this particular day, for whatever reason, I didn't. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. OK, so he was called Carl. I said, Carl, come over here. Let's we'll try again. And maybe you can help. Let's find a way to make it less stupid and make it work better. And this is the suicidal bit. Right. He then said, oh, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> At which point I was kind of like. OK, so effectively what he'd done in front of his colleagues was say, I wasn't actually trying to be helpful or constructive in any way. I was just trying to mess with you. And I think his assumption was that they all thought it was stupid, too, and would all side with him. But of course, they didn't because people don't do that. They were all like, oh, I'm not going near him. And the rest of the day, he was sweet as, as, a, as a lamb because he'd effectively painted himself into a corner by displaying how negative and cynical he was and all i'd do is say all i'd done was say that's a great idea come and help me with that you know it was extraordinary brave well yeah but i mean uh, what would have been probably he was expecting me to join a fight right and mm -hmm. i don't like fighting very much and i think you know uh there's no there's no easy option in a moment like that mm -hmm. right so if you can if you can just whatever you were to choose and i'm sure there would have been lots of other choices that other facilitators would have made but whatever you choose choose it consciously choose it deliberately don't don't let them get to you don't and don't mm. think it's about you again right because yeah. it, it it's not about you he's he, there's something about him you know that's absolute so i think in that moment it's not about you and still somehow i think it is about the facilitator i have these I have these moments where when I design a workshop, I have these very kind of courageous ideas and I want to do a specific activity. And then there's always this, especially when I'm rather going into the vulnerable place or ask participants to be embodied. It cost me a little bit of courage to actually do that. And I've realized that the few times that I then was not courageous enough and changed last second into something safer for me, maybe not even safer for the group, it, it did something to the group. And I have the impression that they could sense in that moment that I didn't trust them to do this exercise that I had originally planned. Yeah, I've had that experience too. And I think that's what I meant earlier about that the people at a deeper level are quite able to pick up on the sort of truthfulness of your work if you like if there's one way of putting it now um all this to say that doesn't mean to say those moments are easy uh it doesn't i'm not suggesting from it it doesn't take courage and i don't think there's any substitute for experience i think 
these are the experiences I'm relating over a very long period of time. And there are many others I could tell where it didn't work out so well. But mm. but to uh, to have all of that be fueling your own learning process, um, you know, to to start to be able to read your own body uh, and only you can do that. And all of our bodies are different in the way that they kind of message us. Uh, it's kind of strange using that terminology because it sounds as if you're not your body and you are, you're continuous with your body. But all I mean is just because it's your body and your feelings doesn't mean that it's immediately apparent what you should do, that there's yeah. skill and craft in practice in learning through experience how to read the signs and signals you as a facilitator get so that you don't wobble in that moment, you know. To own your decision. Yeah. I think... Yeah. You standing there and inviting him to join you to redesign or improve the exercise. It's like, it's, it's this one moment where you cannot go half in. No. And then you lose it. No, you, no. You told, then you would lose the entire group. But owning it and saying, okay, I'm going all in and I risk it. Yeah, yeah. Then it works. Well, and there would have been a, you know, a, a, another strategy would have been, somebody says this is stupid. Another way, which would have been perhaps, if I'd been a bit less experienced, perhaps I might have used this would be to not speak back to that person because that risks being drawn into into direct conflict, because actually what's going on there is that person is seeking attention. And by you entering into conflict, you're giving them what they're seeking. Mm. I'm not saying they're consciously seeking this, but that's my analysis of what's going on. And and if you give the attention to one person, you're abandoning everyone else. Mm -hmm. but that's also something they will sense. So another way to have dealt with that situation would have been to turn to everyone else, actually not giving the person demanding attention your attention and say to them, does anyone else think this is stupid? Now, of course, in this circumstance, lots of people have made very interesting comments already. So I pretty much could have bet that they weren't going to say, yes, we think it's stupid too. And that would have been a, a, a sort of more oblique, perhaps slightly less risky way of dealing with it. Maybe in the short term. And in the long term, you would shoot yourself a bullet in the foot because isolating this person, then they might might become angry. And because if they seek attention, I guess it's their inner child seeking for attention. And then isolating this inner child, they get angry instead of saying, you know what? I thought it was stupid as well. Let's redesign it or kind of finding him an ally so that I think that's right. his inner I think child that's right. doesn't feel lonely anymore. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Now, the the those are the, these are the sort of uh, these are the sort of judgments we get called upon to make because I can also imagine a circumstance where the short term solution might have been the one I chose for other reasons, other part of the context, uh, and then I might have sought another remedy to what was going to become that sort of cauldron of attention seeking frustration and perhaps anger mm -hmm. so i might have gone up to him in the break and mm -hmm. said to him you know carl about thing i i kind of got me but tell me a bit more you know so that there's there's lots of ways of dealing with it and i but i think it's very astute to to point out that you know that that there are that 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 solution whilst in the short term could have been very much more effective would have created another consequence it's not to say that any of these is the right thing to do lots of options of different degrees of bravery and the kind of complex trade-offs you're having to make sense of in the moment which brings us back to the body again because this is all happening way too fast for you to think it through with your intellect and and this is why improvisation is such a good discipline is because the training that they have and the practices that they offer us are not functioning in that space it's not about learning to far think faster so that you can work out what might happen It's about having a much more fluid, a much more intuitive, a much more embodied sense of the options available to you. And then developing that skill alongside the intellect and the cognition and the tools and the models. And would it be something like, almost like buying yourself time to then think through the plan? So sure. you improv, you, you learn how to accept an offer and build on it mm. immediately and mm. thereby kind of creating a, a situation where you can, where you maybe you're unconscious or in the back of your mind, you can think of a solution. 
Yeah, certainly it can it can work in that way. That's not the only way it works because improv can play out in slow motion as well. You know, it doesn't have to all be instantaneous mm. at different levels of scale, at least the way I think of it, you know. So, um, you know, offers, you know, just thinking of the leadership program I was talking about earlier, you know, I would do a session on improvisation on a Monday and sometimes people would realise what I was talking about by Thursday. You know, so so sometimes it plays out in in slower motion. Uh, it's not just about buying yourself time to to get a different response in that same moment, but but absolutely that can that can be the case. So another example, I was uh, facilitating a conference for a beer company in South Africa of a hundred beer guys, and they were almost always guys. And there were some kind of illustrious speakers, the CEO and a few outside speakers, and I was doing. Um, kind of in between stuff you know kind of energy stuff uh, so I had 100 people at uh, 10 tables of 10 no god no it's a thousand it was 100 tables of 10 that's right it was a big conference um, <laughs> it's like different in scale <laughs> yeah yeah one order of magnitude bigger yeah I was just imagining back the room and I was going no that's not 100 people it is a thousand and um, exactly what you describe happened there so I got people up to to do some, a movement-based game and uh, it was a bit silly, uh, perhaps, or it was certainly perceived as that by some people. And one guy shouted out afterwards, what was the point of that? Um, and I said, um, oh, well, thank you for asking that. The point of that uh, was that I have three small children at home and I have this bet with them about what's the silliest thing I can get a thousand uh, important people to do. So thank you very much. I just won the bet. And then, of course, there's uproarious laughter because nobody expected me to say that. And the guy who asked the question also has been sort of slightly put in his place because it's like that was a pretty aggressive, unpleasant thing to do. But I didn't get defensive or aggressive, actually. It was I made a joke out of it. <laughs> Again, so courageous. And then and then uh, there's this moment where I then get to say what I really wanted to say, which was the following. So I said, well, um, just notice that there may not be a point that the point of everything isn't to have a single point. And in the context of this conference, that was quite relevant because they were talking about novelty and innovation and all sorts of things, mm. which you don't quite know what the point of it is yet. Right. Um, and I said, but if you want there to be a point, the point of it, as I saw it, was to get you out of your chairs. You've been sitting down still for an hour and a half and I wanted you to move and have a bit of energy. So what you then offer is the absolutely undeniable value in the exercise. And and I'm pointing out that I'm doing so much in that tiny episode because I'm pointing out that there's a lot, you know, I'm questioning whether always having a point is a good thing. I'm showing the assumptions that led to that. And I'm saying something about you might want to work in a different register, which is the physical or the somatic. And that all took, it's taken far longer to explain it than it took to do. You know, so, um, and in terms of that's courageous, well, I suppose it is, but, but, in the end if you it's like how bad can it be what's you know what's gonna happen um what i'm doing is a few minutes of something and i can kind of assume that most people in the room are very grateful for the chance to get out of their chair so you know absolutely and i it's this funny thing of authenticity that it is courageous because you did it and didn't think it was courageous. If you thought it would be courageous and did it, it would have been silly or dismissive. Or yeah, it's, yeah, it's right? true. And it's, I think it's the thing that must be authentic and come in from the moment out of a yeah. And I, I think the thing, you know, just trying to put myself in the shoes of people listening to this, and I'm thinking, well, you know, oh, yeah, but I couldn't do that. And how do I get there and all that kind of stuff? And I think it's important to say that you get to these places where it no longer feels so courageous or so risky, perhaps is a better word for it. Maybe it's still courageous, but it doesn't feel risky through a process of constant trial and error of of trying something of sticking with that feeling that I shouldn't step back from the thing I feel is right or the thing that I think is bold. Uh, and trying that on a small scale, you know, mm -hmm. and then and having the lived experience of not only surviving, but receiving um, the gratitude of the group, you know, going back to the no again, often when you do uh, do something to perhaps uh, close down or quiet and somebody oh. who's demanding too much attention, even if nobody says anything to you, you can just feel from the rest of the group, they're like, oh, thank goodness somebody did that. 
And and you're the one that can do that. You're the only one that can do that. It's very, very difficult for someone from within the group to do that. And that's part of your role. So you get to these positions by by trying stuff out, by not stepping back, by not constantly staying safe, by expanding kind of, you know, day by day, session by session, the realm of your experience and your practice. Mm. And also, I think by reflecting upon it, so I think that this is back to the intellect working backwards in the sober light of day, the day after or the evening after to look back and say to yourself, well, what went well? And recognize that. And what do I understand about why it went well? And what what wasn't so satisfying as I perceive it? And why might that have been? And what else could I have done? Not to beat yourself up, but to just kind of cement the experience and make sure the experience yields some learning, you know. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. I think to to take the time for the retro, many yeah. of us, me included, are underestimating it. Yeah. I think then the pink he wrote a book about regrets and I used to be the person or I am the person. Oh, I don't do regrets. Right. But actually he points out that there's a this great wisdom. value in actually having yeah. regrets and learning from it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and sharing stories is a good way to do that. You know, so um, many of the stories I've been telling today, I, I would have told friends or colleagues in the immediate aftermath. And in the act of telling the story, I get to realize what happened. Had I not told the story to somebody way back then, I probably wouldn't remember it now. Mm. I may not have learned the lesson. So I think that amongst peers and colleagues, to have a trusted peer where you can, or group of peers that you can go to and share stories um, and see what others make of them, you know, um, I think is 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 a great resource. And I've always been blessed with, you know, great colleagues and peers with whom I'm very comfortable both both hearing their stories and sharing mine, you know. Mm. Yeah, to overcome this uh, shame of a facilitator. Yeah, yeah. Is it, uh, It's quite vulnerable to speak about these stories where we didn't react in a way we wish we had or that yeah. were challenging. Yeah. Mm. What remains your number one facilitation challenge? Yeah, I mean... I, it depends which way I interpret that question. I think I have two responses to that. So, so uh, it remains a challenge for me what to do about kind of the dominant alpha males. Um, because I think that the context, the context kind of allows them, and I should say they're not always, I'm talking about a character type here, they're not always mm -hmm. men most often. But the, the people who sort of act as if they have a divine right to speak and will kind of, kind of dominate other people without really checking or asking or sensing or feeling and um so i'd still list that as a challenge because although i've got umpteen resources to do about that it's a challenge i think it's a bigger challenge for us as a society because i think we still sort of give too much license to that kind of behavior so it's sort of a, a macro challenge in the workshop itself i find it a very tedious challenge i'm like oh god here we go again all right i gotta do that i gotta do this so it's it's challenging to me internally because i'm so bored of it <laughs> um, and I'm sort of hoping that I don't have to deal with it ever again and it keeps keeps coming back. Although increasingly I tend not to work in those contexts uh, or the context where that's more likely. So that's one way of interpreting it. But I think the other more interesting challenge for me, I would say is almost the opposite, which I think that a really meaningful and powerful and uh, a challenge for me personally at the moment is about increasing my own and a group's capacity for silence. Mm. So I think that we, I think silence is much underrated, much misunderstood. Um, we had this in a, a, a small group. I run this thing called Yellow, which is small online learning groups. And as part of the check-in a couple of weeks ago, there was a long silence after we framed the check-in question. And the first person who spoke presumed to comment on the silence itself and to interpret it in a particular way as nervous, nervousness or reticence. And the second person who spoke, uh, to her credit, took issue with that and said, that's your interpretation of the silence. I was just thinking. And so I think in microcosm, that's what we have a lot. I think silence is often far more productive than we realize. Uh, I think we often speak without thinking and silence is an opportunity to create some space for thinking. This takes me straight to pause, of course. Um, and I think that 
I've been lucky enough to have uh, contact with a number of places where um, uh, a form of dialogue first articulated by David Bohm and Jiddu Krishnamurti, which consists mostly of silence, is practiced quite deeply. And it's quite interesting how groups can increase their tolerance for silence. Uh, and when somebody comes in from the outside who's not used to it, they kind of interpret it as sort of lack of engagement and, you know, uh, and I think there are different qualities of silence as well. There's, you know, there's a very active kind of silence as well as a sort of bored form of silence or confusion. So, yeah, I think that uh, from a facilitator's perspective, making it easier for people to be silent together mm. is a really, that's a challenge I really warm to. Mm. Silence is a topic that's definitely <laughs> very close to my heart in facilitation. I love to play with silence. And I wonder whether facilitating to sit with silence to a group has to do with a sense of psychological safety. Because mm. to many silence feels threatening and maybe because they don't have the um, ability yet to listen to the sounds of silence to interpret it because there's so many nuances and I think as facilitators at some point we we can distinguish them and what I love about silence is also that I think by pausing and um and using silence, we can show the group and the participants that we're holding the space for them to think and to answer, that we're really interested in the answer. I and think I think the way so how... Fun. Yeah, I think that's so, so true. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, so that's where it begins. I mean, thinking about, okay, so how do you do this? Well, I think the first place is to, is, is almost to honor them by allowing yourself to be silent. So there are many times when um you know i'll be in a workshop and i'll say okay so now let's see okay here's what we'll do you know so i will have at that point probably heard some feedback and i'm making a decision and so again it gives seriousness to my decision or if i've asked them a question to honor their their response and i think that you can you can model that for them and i think you can start that in tiny ways because we're so intolerant of silence that even five or ten seconds feels like forever um and and as they see you doing that they may not consciously realize that but first of all there is some silence in the session secondly for the reasons we've both kind of mentioned there's there's some importance or significance being given to things things are being spoke uh, thought about not just spoken of and and that invites them to to slow down a bit and to have silence and and not feel they have to talk and it also changes the relationship with the people who are naturally quieter because it it, it shows that you don't only value the speech yeah and i find it especially humbling in large groups large online groups as a facilitator or trainer, me asking a question to a hundred people who are online. And of course it is daring to unmute and to say something into the space. So I think me just not giving them enough time to find the courage to find the unmute button and then to speak Absolutely. is just honoring them. And it is an absolute game changer. Mm. So if yeah. I realize that if I can just sit there with 10 seconds, 15 seconds of silence and someone will break it amongst a hundred oh, people, there's always someone who will break the silence. Absolutely. And suddenly people start speaking, people yeah. start speaking, they turn their cameras on and off you go. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. A, a, a friend of mine uh, in the, the latest edition of the improv book, there's uh, an interview with Hugh Derrick who facilitates for a company called Eat Big Fish. And he talks about, uh, in this vein, he says, so as a facilitator, what you should do is think of a number that feels uncomfortable for you to hold for silence and then double it. Mm. You count in your head. And I think that's great advice. Uh, that just going a little bit further 
you know and it it made me smile because um your 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 comment that you know if there's 100 people somebody will break the silence because they will because that's that's you know people people are like um somebody asked me once oh you know when you do these improv exercises what happens when nobody volunteers and i said i have no idea because somebody always volunteers and that's a different form of silence but as a facilitator there all you have to be is what we call an improv fit and well so physically comfortable you know uh, just in yourself while you wait you know so you ask for a volunteer and everybody's sitting there shrinking and terrified and somebody will volunteer yeah. and then and then you appreciate them and see them for that um back to what we were saying earlier about priming you know you can you can make it easier for people by 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 saying that you don't tell them what you can ask them to volunteer for because that kind of defeats the object mm. in improv anyway but you say to them uh, you you make the honest promise that you're not going to do anything which will embarrass them or cause them distress right um so you can say that and then you just wait and then somebody will come and then you say thank you <laughs> you know it's not it's not rocket science yeah. And if you're comfortable waiting, then everyone will feel comfortable. It's only if you don't feel comfortable waiting, then everyone will have this kind of discomfort and, creeping up there. And, and actually, there's, a, there's another thing that you can do, right? So, but again, the improv doctrine of uh, or idea of everything's an offer. So the awkward, uncomfortable silence is an, is an offer which you can take and use. So if it feels really awkward and uncomfortable, I will just say, I'm quite happy to wait. Mm -hmm. And and as soon as you say that, then then it changes again because people kind of go, oh right then I will volunteer, you know, because because he clearly he's he's going to wait as least as long as we are. So, you know, uh, and and again that's just a simple naming of what's already there. Mm. Yeah, I um to honor the importance of silence and facilitation, I recorded a, one of these one minute shorts videos um where we would just stand in front of the camera in silence for a minute <laughs> just stand the camera with the title how long can you hold silence and then yeah. just mentioning how important it is for a facilitator that was that was awkward yeah that's I awkward say. i mean the other thing to, to acknowledge here is people's people's responses um people's thought happens at different rhythms and paces you know and mm. i'm quite conscious that mine happens quite fast It doesn't feel fast to me, but other people tell me you're so fast. So if I know I'm fast, then I can kind of go, okay, well, it feels like a long time to me, but to other people, and Alex, who I I work with in yellow, is a great counterpoint because he's he his mind works at let's say at a greater depth than mine, but at a slower rhythm. And so the, you know, I'll be making connections very quickly and he'll be sitting in you know with deep questions so we kind of learn from each other i know to kind of pass to him if if i feel i'm getting a bit runaway you know mm -hmm. and he'll know to pass to me if he feels it's becoming turgid or arid and stuff like that nicely complimentary yeah very very sweet yeah yeah, yeah. i am conscious of the time and <laughs> Okay, I just interpret this that um, another question is okay, because sure. maybe one and a half hour, almost one and a half hours ago, <laughs> you mentioned the fun barrier. Oh, yeah. So uh, that, that what you've just done there, we have a word for that in improv, it's called reincorporation. Um, so using something from earlier and bringing it back in, in, in in the end of something is a great way to, to move towards an ending actually um so very elegantly done uh, and along the way one of the other beauties of that is it shows and demonstrates extended listening so if somebody's been able to call something back from the beginning of the meeting and use it at the end it kind of is a really powerful thing for a group so as a facilitator if you can do that uh it's it's fantastic yeah the fun barrier was something that um that gary and i noticed early on so uh, and this is a while ago so things may have kind of shifted and changed a bit since then but when you invite people to do something they don't usually do at work which is to be playful to move um to shout or sing or run around or do things that 
might feel childlike or, or silly, but which actually for the vast majority of people are enormously exciting and fun for the very reason that they don't often get to do them. And there's a natural physical exuberance comes with that. Um, what can happen is that people uh, kind of um, suspend their uh, cognitive and critical faculties. They just throw themselves into the exercise. And so that can be so distracting. The barrier here is it's so much fun that all they notice is the fun. Mm. And so, um, you know, Gary and I, I think we learned this most uh, most clearly. There was a session, we were doing a week of workshops. We were in, in Thailand and for a big multinational company, we were doing a different workshop every day for a whole week as part of a, a bigger conference. And there was one particular group that we did so much sort of playful, physical, energetic warm up, um, what we called warm up. They had no energy left for anything else. So that's kind of one consequence of it. But but in in the con con, con in the context of say the leadership program at Oxford, um, the way the fun barrier showed up there was that we we were doing something that they really wouldn't expect at a serious old university. Um, and they could appreciate the need for that in terms of ice breaking or. What the, what the academics call creating learning readiness. Um, <laughs> but that would stop them from seeing sometimes that um, actually I was using the improvisational exercises to make some very important points about navigating complexity and uncertainty mm -hmm. and that there was intellectual content here as well, that reflective piece after the action. And so what that did, noticing that early on, uh, informed my, both my design and my practice in the room which is to to not go too overboard on the fun not let the fun be the main thing not let the fun take over uh, and to kind of modulate a, a big loud expansive physical exercise with perhaps a quieter more focused one still interactive still participative so just just know that sometimes your success can be your own worst enemy if you're trying to have people have fun that you can do that so well that they fail to notice you've got something serious to say as well. Interesting. And it's, um, I was just laughing in the beginning because when I heard fun barrier, I was thinking actually about the exact opposite. Mm. So the cognitive barrier to actually engage in the fun in the first place. And yeah, that, that exists too. It's just not the name that we gave to it. The, yeah. the, the if i may just the my response to that would would be to to name it you know so the apprehension beforehand you know so you know i will often begin an exercise or a workshop by saying um you're probably feeling uh, apprehensive or nervous now and if you're not you're not paying attention because you should be <laughs> um, because then what you've done is mm -hmm. you've turned the table so you've made them right for what you know they feel but you've done it in a kind and sympathetic and funny way um, that suddenly means, oh, I'm not wrong to feel this. I'm not Beautiful. wrong to feel apprehensive. Um, so, uh, so then you, in a weird roundabout paradoxical way, kind of gain their willingness to participate because you've seen them. Uh, and if you do it in a, you can then sort of follow that up by saying, you know, so we're going to do something which is a bit unusual. And you might think it's silly and maybe it is, but anyway, you know, go with me here. You know, and you've you've got enough credit uh, by that point um, to take them with you. So yeah, there's a there is that barrier too. It's just not what we call the fun barrier. <laughs> and it's a beautiful, elegant way to to overcome that. Thank you. Yeah, and yeah, it's if you think about it, it's a it's a very similar phenomenon to something I've mentioned in many different ways today, which is just naming what's already there. Yeah. You know, yeah. and. But the act of naming it shows you're paying attention to it. It shows that whatever they're feeling matters to you, matters to you enough to notice it and comment upon it. And the, by the simple act of doing that, then other things become possible that wouldn't be mm. if you if you didn't name it. Yeah. And then to, to come back to the real fun barrier. Mm. So how would you then kind of basically lower the flame of mm. <laughs> the cooking stove without without throwing a block in because i can imagine if you have these groups and then there is excitement and you can as an experienced facilitator you sense oh oh this is too much they won't have the cognitive skills anymore to bring it right. home 
Yeah, so um, so there's a number of things. So um, you can choose the next exercise to contrast to that in the way I mentioned earlier. So make it smaller, make it... Often the fun barrier comes out when you're doing things with the whole group where you've got 20 or 30 people's energy all coming together in this sort of mm. massive tidal wave, wave, which can be really useful, obviously. But you so, so one thing I might do is so next time we'll do a pair game. So the next one out of the blocks is going to be two people doing something quite small, quite intimate. Um, but but there's a prior step you can do uh, within the exercise itself that's maybe generating this excessive energy, which is to connect something that's happening in that seeming uh, kind of uh, exuberance to something serious. So if you can find a, an, ob an observation about something that's happened, so let's say for the sake of argument, there's a game which involves um, uh, a sound and an action and everybody running around madly copying each other. Uh, and then as soon as somebody else starts another one, you copy that and all that kind of stuff. And this is a, this, you know, people might just stay at that level about, oh yeah, we got to run around, but we're making stupid sounds and noises. So if in that you kind of say, okay, we'll carry on that doing it for a, a we're going to do another round now. We'll start with some more sounds and movements and whatever. But what I'd like you to pay attention to is notice what happens when you have to change from one pattern of behavior to another. Because changing from one pattern of behavior to another is something you have to do at work, isn't it? In many different contexts. So, so then you've opened it all where they go, oh, not just fun. And, and, you know, I could go much further. I could, you know, I have an armory of stories and anecdotes that will link it to, you know, Jack Welsh or the commander of a U.S. Navy ship or a film director or quantum physics or something like that. But one way or another, what I'm trying to do is to take something that's in the exercise and connect it to something that is, seems substantial, important, worth thinking about, worthy of my consideration. Because then you've got them both playing the game and and thinking about the consequences of the game mm -hmm. at the same time. Which is also a leadership skill to, to get yourself into the meta level. Right. So to be yeah. in a situation and at the same time looking at it from a bird's eye. Yeah. So and, and I'm going to do now what I just spoke about in this very conversation to say, yes, just like Ronald Heifetz. So Ronald Heifetz idea and adaptive leadership and his work on that subject and about getting on the balcony, not on the dance floor. You know, and so in if I do that, where I've quoted a famous professor from Harvard, I show that I've read stuff. I've got language for it, which is exactly the same phenomenon as you've described, but I've given the language of somebody who's known in the field and they may not know about high fits or adaptive leadership, but it doesn't matter. All of a sudden, by making such a comment, oh, right, now we're in the hands of somebody who may be having us do these silly games, but there's a there's a backdrop, there's a backstory. This is relating to something which I might not see yet, but it will become apparent. Interesting. Which then refers to what you mentioned earlier, the authority bit that mm. usually you might not want as a facilitator. But in these situations where you might be seen as the guy who does silly stuff with us. Exactly. It is a good priming to get them back into this. That's right. Um, and yeah, yeah, that absolutely. And so it's a very good observation that about everything is contextual. So um, in the context of doing silly stuff, to have some serious things up your up your sleeve is useful. If you're doing very serious stuff, to have some kind of lighter moments or 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 jokes, not rehearsed jokes, but kind of moments of levity, to be willing to laugh at yourself is probably really productive as mm -hmm. well. So whatever your context is, make sure that you're able to puncture or counterpoint your kind of the, that context with something contrasting, you know, and that yeah. adds depth and substance. Yeah, as long as it remains authentic. I think there's nothing worse than a facilitator who tries to be funny by throwing in some scripted jokes. Oh, that's terrible. And <laughs> it would be terrible also. So it also has to be, I think, responsive and appropriate. So mm -hmm. I hadn't planned to tell the story about Heifetz, but because we were talking about it and because you literally use the same metaphor about being up above, not on the dance floor, then I kind of go, oh yeah, a bit like this. So I'm not, Whereas if I'd come in and, and said, let me tell you about Ronald Heifetz, you know, then I'm I'm up myself, right? And then it's like, oh God, why should I listen to him? Whereas 
if somebody says or does something or you observe something in the room and then you can kind of go, yeah, that's a bit like this. And you're, you're clearly responding to the thing that was in the room, mm. then, then you're adding. Um, and, you know, this goes back to what we were saying earlier about to me, what makes a work, workshop or a facilitation, what, what constitutes failure is that lack of responsiveness, lack of sensitivity, lack of attention, lack of care in the end, a lack of love really, you know, that, yeah. The act of facilitating is to pay exquisite attention uh, in order to take care of a group of people and their interests, which are going to be complex and inter interacting and sometimes contradictory. And you don't have to resolve those, but your job is to, through, through paying exquisite attention, to take care of them and to, 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 to show that you care about, about what's going on. You know? mm. so, accepting offers yeah yeah exactly um and the nice thing about you know accepting offers doesn't tell you how you should accept it mm. so you still have freedom of choice you still can be you um these aren't prescriptive rules you have to follow there's as many ways of doing any of these things as there are people to do them um so there's an enormous scope for you to find your own way your own style your own mood um but these ideas are kind of a beautiful piece of sort of incredibly elegant, simple scaffolding to help you kind of construct uh, and hold a space. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, it's so interesting talking to you because it's like you're psychic. It's amazing. Um, so there's this incredible kind of resonance and sort of sensitivity. And it's like, I'm um, the question you ask is kind of just where I was like, it's like being in midstream and stepping from one stepping stone to another and the stepping stone's not there. And then the stone gets put there. So there's a kind of, so all of the questions you ask as well as displaying to my mind, an incredible uh, experience and accomplishment. You couldn't ask those questions. You wouldn't ask those questions if you didn't have such a kind of wealth of experience yourself, but it's just a, a beautiful kind of, unfolding you know it's like like pulling aside the foliage and inviting the you know into into a forest is fantastic Thank you. <laughs> i love <her. laughs> i mean you know uh we should we should i would love to find other ways to collaborate so um uh yeah i it's just a joy talking with you yeah thank you it was uh like a dance hmm felt yeah. very um, yeah. yeah and still there was one topic that i had to leave behind yeah we'll another, wait there for another time another day yeah yeah thank you all right well uh let me know what else you need from me if uh if anything and and when it goes out and everything so um yeah um and i would love to find other ways to collaborate yeah so i'll think about that so you know we have lots of collaborators in yellow um uh the way we design um uh you kind of you can't uh, you can never promise anything because we're always designing in response to what comes up but this is almost the best way you kind of go oh god i wonder what there might be we could do with miriam you know and and then priming again lo and behold an opportunity shows up shows up um and uh the way it works is once you've once you've collaborated then you get invited to you know we don't pay people because we can't but we we kind of cultivate the community and so it's a really interesting community to to belong to so um but there's no obligation involved so um so yeah i'll, I'll talk to alex about that and see and and likewise actually if there's something if you've got a i will say a little bit so what works with yellow what's run, unusual about it is half-baked things work mm. it's not a show and tell space it's a kind of um i've been thinking about this and i've kind of got this far and what do you think kind of a space you know so if there's a a question or a challenge or an issue that that you that you think you think of it as a kind of research space because mm -hmm. as well as the small groups those those are a, a bit different but we have these kind of um what we call side streams where we have we invite everybody to these and often there's a guest and the guest will or come along with something somebody had this brilliant question all she did was a friend of mine called leonara oppenheim who's a feldenkrais practitioner and an artist and a designer and um 
she had this question which was um it was about embodiment what was it now it was something like oh what does it mean to use your body as a research tool and so all she did this is an hour and a half session with about a dozen people and she just said look the question i've been interested in for two years which i've been exploring in my felon crest practice and in my art practice is what does it mean to have the body as a research tool and that was literally all she said <laughs> and then awesome. an hour and a half of amazing conversation flowed from just that so so yeah i'll I'll bear you in mind. I'll talk to Alex. I'll think about, oh, there might be there'd be something if we were to come to you that would always be at short notice because we we're always designing two weeks out, no more. Um, but the other way around, if there's something you have a kind of, yeah, like a half-baked hunch, I'm not sure, don't know where, but I'm really curious, then bring it to us and we'll see what we can do with it. And uh, you made me laugh <laughs> because so the the community that I'm building is called never done before oh. all we do is so there's only one condition for any workshop we there invite facilitators and i invite my podcast guests to offer is stuff they've never done before oh the great eight, the unpolished diamonds and oh, that's brilliant i've done um and there are three things that i've tested there that had an impact that went beyond my imagination I just uh -huh. need, quickly need to um, to share that because I think yeah, it's I interesting for this. One was the question, can we deeply listen to each other without hearing the words? Okay. So basically we turn, I was wondering since in every workshop, there's always this moment where like, you're on mute. How would it be if you're like, you're not on mute? <laughs> so um we picked a topic that would be so daring to speak about if you're not muted, that you want to make sure that you nobody can listen to you. And what right. does it do to the group dynamics and to trust and bonding and connection if yeah. you basically speak to yourself? So we picked the topic of sexuality. Yeah. No, and no, it no. was amazing what happened. Right. Um, so that was one... And the other one, I did a question dojo recently. So oh, how can we? Brilliant. How can we learn? I I was um and I did that. I tested it because I was de um, invited to a leadership offsite to give a keynote speech, and they wanted to be challenged. And I told them that basically they were asking the wrong questions. Yeah. And invited them to train to ask better questions. Oh, that's great. And that yeah. was a very nice format as well that I would love to repeat um, because I yeah. think it's very, um, very good actually to learn to ask better questions, to reflect uh, uh, on the questions we're asking. Yeah, no, definitely. No, there's so many connections. There's many echoes and resonances with things we've done in yellow before um, and other things I've done in other kind of formats and other venues. So, so do I get, it's, so if I have an idea for never done before, can I bring yes, it? Yes, please. Okay, great. Okay. Yes. So just so I know the mechanics of that. So how does, how, how does that work? That community, how many how, time people, how does all of that kind of function? Um, is it regular? Does it? Yeah. It's a year long membership. Right. Um, we are about 150 people from, I think 32 countries. Wow. So literally around the world. We have Nigeria and uh, Singapore and um and Brazil. And um it's I invite podcast guests um to deliver workshops um to test basically their never done before ideas. Right. And um community members um can just offer their own tests. Um, and so we have, I think we have between two and five sessions per week. So whatever, oh, wow. so, God, so we cool. accept all F, F offers. Right? Right, so right. if someone wants to host, um, a mastermind, then we have a mastermind, we have improv meetups, we have book clubs. And sometimes after one session, we realize, okay, it didn't really work. We don't need that anymore. And yeah. others just continue. Right, right. And then we have once per year, we have the festival, uh, a 24 hours online festival 
um, which happens in November. So, right. um, yeah, November 18th. And this year we have, I think, 30 workshops. All never done before. So, all the ones that are kind of during the regular run of things, like how many people show up? Is it like the, the do you know who's going to show up or no? Great. No, it's just anything early. between, I would say, five and 25 or 30. Yeah, right. Um, we had one workshop which was 90 minutes in silence. So, can we yeah. collaborate without speaking a word? How was that? It was, I think it was one of the workshops where I learned the most about wow. facilitation, about silence, about communication. Um, it was extremely discomforting. I bet, yeah. 90 uh -huh. minutes is a long time, yeah. Yeah. But then we had a whiteboard, so we had to find different ways to communicate. And I realized the impact of music mm. and how you... You cannot be distracted at all because you don't have the auditive clues. So you constantly have to see, okay, where is someone with the cursor? What are they doing? Are they thinking or are they not understanding? Yeah. 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 So. Oh, great. And, 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 uh, it'd be, can I, as well as offering a workshop, can I come to one in order to just feel how that space is to think about what I might do in it? Or does it not work like that? Um, yeah, so it is um, it is a paid community mm -hmm. and um, there are always opportunities to just join a workshop as a taster, yeah, especially, when, cool. especially when you want to host one. Yeah, no, I'll do, uh, that, that, that's fine. Just a taster. Yeah, exactly. Um, let me um, calendar page. Here we go. There is a link. I think it's even on the website, actually. Yeah, I'll find it. Don't worry. Um, it's never done before dot org, and I think on the website is our um, is the calendar. And do, do you have, as, I mean, obviously lots of people kind of involved, but do you have kind of collaborators, close partners that, because it's amazing what you're doing here. There's so much stuff. Yeah. So the um, the funny thing is, and um, so what has emerged through that, so not only many community members now start to collaborate outside the community. Yeah. What has also happened is that I won the first big client multinational mm -hmm. that they need trainings and workshops for their workforce they have a hundred and hundred thousand people working for them mm. around the globe so they need trainings in all different time zones in all different languages <laughs> so and they don't and they need also someone who helps them to basically adjust the content to the cultural setup Right. So um, this was something that was just presented to me. I haven't even thought about the opportunity. And now that it happened, I was like, of course, I would be stupid not to see the opportunity of becoming an agency. Yeah, right. Um, because we can offer, We. it's not, all of our facilitators come from different parts and have different backgrounds. Yeah. It's not like you would go to AJ and Smart or to PWC where you get the standard yeah. kind of format because everyone went through the same training. Yeah. But everyone brings in their own educational piece. Wow. So if we design something collaboratively, um, we have all these different yeah. cultural backgrounds and um, trainings. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, look, I, I should go because of my son i'm meant to be taking him out for a driving lesson now but it's a, a delight and we'll see yeah I'll, I'll have a look never done before i'll think of something i mean pretty much everything i do i've never done before so you know yellow we've designed now over the last two and a half years uh it's up to about 175 completely unique sessions that we've never done before you know uh for the small groups uh and uh and the wider groups so um but there's sure to be something i can think of that um mm. is out there that i haven't tried um so yeah I'll have i would love that and so um yeah look at the look at the calendar it's quite um just quickly just to point you where it is so it's quite low on the 
Okay, I got it. Yeah. And then here you see all the different workshops oh. that are coming up in the next month. And usually the calendar fills um yeah. Yeah. Everything that right. has happened beforehand. Yeah. And um so if there's anything that is interesting, um let me know. Otherwise yeah. Um, just... yeah. And yeah. Um I was thinking, as you mentioned, that uh you've in in yellow you're doing all this never done before. Mm. What could be another interesting podcast episode mm -hmm. um, is to have a conversation about never done before as a mindset and concept, because right. I think that I've learned so much from just leaning into this never done. Be it's I almost feel weird if I do something for a second time. Yeah, but I think I, it's a muscle yeah. that we can train and it yeah. would be interesting to peel that onion on a meta level. Mm, I think that would be fascinating. Yeah. And uh, again, I think that's quite, it sounds very, it might sound quite straightforward to you and I, but that's actually, for most people, that's really radical because the the ambition is always to do the exact opposite. So for example, I you laughed when I said it, but normally I say it quite, quite more explicitly, which is I say, I normally am quite proud of how stupid yellow is if what you're seeking is efficiency. So I normally say mm. so. The design process in yellow is absolutely stupid because we are always designing. But but that's because that's what we like. Like the death for me would be doing the same thing every time, you know. Yeah. And there are things that we that we echo, if you like. So not everything is 100 percent original. So one of the things that we've uh, done a number of times is is to look at a painting. Mm. We have a small group look at a painting. We ask a single question, which is what do you see? Mm. And that normally lasts us two hours so we've tried that with a number of different paintings and always it's with a different group and actually we ask the question and the subsidiary questions in a different way but actually in that context as soon as you change the piece of art it's completely different you know and we would never use the same painting twice because because we've already seen it so that wouldn't work for us yeah so we've got to be looking for the first time and even then i say you know that we've done that i think three times out of 100 and however many it is um so there are you know that the first session we have uh we have a way we do the first session which is we've it was interesting actually we we would borrow from a friend of mine who you'd also really like a guy called johnny moore also a facilitator actually if you look him up he's in cambridge he's got a book called unhurried at work and his whole thing is unhurried conversations. Yes. He, Could you introduce I, me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he's you. great. He's a very close friend. And and so we use the format of an unhurried conversation in the first session of any yellow group because it's got all the elements that you want. Now, but the thing is about young hurried is it's almost nothing anyway, right? It's like, and, and actually what we've also done, even then we've deliberately tried other things, you know, because we don't like, as it were, doing the same thing. But we've, we have now settled and said, no, there is there is some genius in what Johnny does and the way he does it that we need to acknowledge and recognize. But it's really just a, that's yeah. just the tiniest bit of holding structure at the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I totally that, relate to that. And yeah. um, what I was just thinking of, and then I let you go. I um, recently we had um, Patrick and Ola, a Filipino and a Nigerian guy. They hosted a session where they weren't looking at paintings, but at um, not comics. Uh, how do you call the cartoons? The further side of humanity, which is okay, right? Um, very British. Um, I think it's British humor from maybe the seventies, right? And to go through a process of what do you see in a cartoon from decades ago, depending on which cultural context you're coming from, was just oh, mind-blowing. Yeah, to listen great. to the reflections of a Nigerian guy looking at the same kind of cartoon was just mind-blowing. Yeah, that's genius. Yeah, yeah. And I think they haven't even anticipated this impact of their session. <laughs> yeah yeah fantastic okay well um yeah I'll definitely i'll introduce it to johnny i'll send you both an email and uh i'll have a look at, at the calendar of i've never done before and um yeah we'll look for uh, uh more opportunities to 
to connect. Um, yeah, and to record something maybe towards the end of the year about learnings from doing something for the first time for a community. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, would be very interesting. Great. All right, that's it. Count me in. Awesome. All right. Thanks a million. Happy driving lessons. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.